Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ninth annual and first ever virtual Fink Investing Conference at UCLA Anderson. My name is Laurie Santikian. I'm the faculty director of the Fink Center for Finance and a professor of finance and strategy here at Anderson. I want to welcome you to your own home to join us in exploring some of the most pressing issues faced by investors today. This gathering, even in this atypical format, is exactly the purpose of the Fink Center to join together the Anderson family of students, faculty, and alumni, together with the practitioner community in finance on topical issues. Today, we are privileged to have with us Ken Leach, a bona fide Hall of Famer in fixed income. He's the Chief Investment Officer of Stern Asset, where he's been for the last 30 years and has overseen astronomical growth in the firm's assets under management. We are equally privileged to be led in this discussion by Tony Bernardo a bona fide expert in corporate finance and capital structure. He is also our new Dean at UCLA Anderson, uh, while remaining an esteemed researcher and beloved teacher on the uh, uh, faculty of uh, finance. So please join me in welcoming Ken Leach and Dean Tony Bernardo. Thank you, Lori. Uh, thank you so much, Ken, for joining us today. Uh, it's really wonderful that you could take the time to meet with our community. I hope you and all your loved ones are healthy and safe. Uh, before we get started, I think it'd be nice if uh, you could maybe just say a few words to all our participants. We have many participants on the call here today, and then uh, we'll get into our Q&A. And uh, just so all of you know and uh, uh, who are participating, we have a Slido app. We have information about that uh, that will be available to you so that we can take your questions and uh, we'll uh, begin with some Q&A between uh, uh, me and Ken, but uh, we're happy to take uh, your questions and uh, that way we can further our discussion. So Ken, uh, if you have a few uh, thoughts for our participants, uh, then we can get into our uh, question and answer. Yes, well, I, yes, well, I wanna thank everyone for having me on the call. I really appreciate it. I, I, uh, you know, I've been to, to the UCLA. I was part of the investment manager forum all, all through the early 2000s. Been a number of events there actually uh, even though I've been at Western Asset for 30 years I actually been doing this for 40 years and so in, in the early 80s I actually started my career with Larry Fink uh, long ago and even though we were both in our 20s I think he was already three or four management levels above me on his meteoric rise but I get the chance to come out there anytime he's in town so I, I really do I really do appreciate it. this is this is a spectacular uh, period of time there have been a lot of different episodes we all know but this one is probably a little different than anything we've ever uh, faced before but uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to have a discussion great well what you know a lot of the focus uh, for today's discussion <clears throat> is around the crisis and one of the things I, I, I'm interested I'm sure our participants are interested in is you know how do you prepare in advance for these kinds of events do you you know, did you ever sort of have a plan uh, for, uh, you know, something uh, like this? I know it's an extraordinarily rare event, but it has been something that's been discussed among a lot of people, including Bill Gates over the years. And then secondly, related to that, uh, we got a little bit of advance notice uh, that something like this might be coming. We learned about what happened in Wuhan uh, at the end of 2019, 2020. Of course, we didn't realize that it would uh, take on the proportions that it has, but I'd just like to get a sense of how uh, you uh, prepare in the abstract and then how you prepared once you had uh, some sense that this might develop from what we learned in Wuhan. Um, yeah, Tony, I wish I could say that, uh, you know, you know, I had the perspicacity to, 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 to see a global pandemic uh, coming early. As we get into this question, I, I uh, I should have noted already that as, as a member of that investment manager forum, the, the liaison with the uh, Anderson School was uh, Professor Richard Roll, and uh, Dick's on our boards. And he told me that uh, when I'm answering your questions, I should mind my P's and Q's because he said, not only are you an accomplished academic, but you've won every teaching award they've ever given out at the Anderson School. So please take it easy on me here. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, as you said, we, we did not see the, this coming before it started. We did, as you say, get a little advance notice in, in, uh, in, 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 in December, actually in January. Interestingly, we have a woman who's, uh, who works in our London office whose father is a retired physician, won 
province over from Wuhan, and he kept telling us that there was no problem, it was contained. Essentially, he had the Chinese government's party line. So it tells you how effectively they kept communication that you could be just in China, in the medical community, close by, and not know. So I, I do think it, it was um, it, it, the, 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 you know, the, the information came to us. We think we reacted uh, as you need to do in this business to be, 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 be pretty quick to, to react and, and, and to be willing to face uh, events as they're changing. Um, uh, you know, and the environment was pretty spectacular. I do think, though, this was interesting because not only was it the disease itself, but it was also the, the, the political reaction and decisions to shut down, you know, the economic activity, which was also you had to anticipate uh, the, the response function as well. So both of those are tough. One of the things we do do with your second question, though, is we always run stress tests, scenario analysis on our portfolio so that we always have a sense of, you know, kind of the limits of, of, of uh, you know, p &L drawdown uh, during events. And then as soon as we do see an event like this, we try and um, – you know, game kind of scenarios, just kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're obviously, uh, you know, somewhat judgmental, but we're, we're trying to say, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? How bad could it get? How long can it last and, and run some stress tests there? But I would say, you know, based on my experience, that the key uh, in the investment management business in the community, and, and I'm sure all your students are aware of this, it's really, you have to have some flexibility and reactive uh, kind of a Kind of a mindset right because conditions do change and 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 and, and the, the features that are driving markets or the economy or politics can change very quickly rapidly and so this is not the first time you know that the events that came center stage changed and so you just have to be able to be able to regroup be thoughtful and uh and react uh to to that uh, it, you know especially when you uh manage a large uh, number of assets uh, and, and in particular, we saw a lot of illiquidity in, in, in yeah. markets, bond markets in particular, you know, how do you, you know, you, you need to be nimble, but at the same time, the markets don't necessarily yeah. allow you to be nimble. How, how do you navigate, uh, you know, a rapid change in say investment thesis in an environment where you have so much illiquidity? Well, that, I mean, that, that's, this this probably was the most exceptional example of how difficult things got because as you know it was the quickest, sharpest downturn in risk assets uh, in history in less than a month's time and and liquidity did evaporate and if you're a large asset manager you you cannot you cannot navigate very easily I think the VIX went to to the highest level it's ever been 82 or something, put that in perspective, that means that the stock market, a five percent move in the stock market in one day would have put you just outside the top you know. 20 or so events in long-term history. And, and yet it was, the market was pricing as if you should expect a 5% repricing every single day. So I do think that you have to be, um, you know, the good thing about fixed income, if you're, if you're a high grade fixed income manager, hopefully you're buying assets that you, you, you believe in as a long-term value proposition are going to be able to, to stand uh, the test of time. So you don't, you don't need to, you know, have, um, you don't need to have the, the kind of anxiety or, or panic that you would uh, otherwise need, but, it was a little bit of luck of the draw. If you'd have, if I'd have told you that I invested in uh, Ford Motor five-year notes in February, you would have probably yawned. Uh, they went down 38 points in in, uh, in two weeks. So it was a spectacular change in the environment. But I do think you have to just you have to you have to do what you can, which which might be uh, you know minimal in the short run. But as soon as um, you do regain liquidity, you have to have your plan in place and know how you want to reposition going forward. And that that's that's really what that was our game plan. Yeah. Um, I, you know, one of the things you've, you've uh, spoken about recently, um, you know, is that the, the timing and, and the slope uh, of the recovery still remains the, the largest uncertainty that we face. And I wonder, um, be, you know, in, in that, uh, given that, um, um, how do you sort of, how do you proceed in a market like that, and and what sort of opportunities does uh, do you think that creates? Yeah, so this this you know the the change in environment you know was so swift. If you think about the beginning of the year, it seems like you know in, in COVID nineteen time six years ago, right January, but you know the U.S. economy was on a very strong footing. Things were going well. It looked like the global economy was finally going to get a little bit of pickup. 
we had the Brexit resolution, or at least the diminution of, of the tensions there, and and the and the, and, and the China-U.S. trade tensions were dialed down a bit. And all of a sudden, you go from an expectation of actually a pickup in global growth and a, and a pretty solid U.S. economy to within within less than a month, the market pricing and not negligible possibility of a global depression. I mean, it's extraordinary. And 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 the uh, and what's going to determine the path is a disease, which is obviously, you know, if you're a financial professional, that not really your, you know, you're outside your lane trying to trying to try, trying to figure out how to navigate that. So the political response in most of the most of the uh, developed world was to close down huge chunks of uh, economic activity to fight this disease uh, from a humanitarian perspective by, 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 by allowing people to stay in place. That caused even, you know, that, that just caused unbelievable economic, uh, you know, you know, downdraft, uh, but for which they had to have a, 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 you know, kind of an offsetting policy response, which of course is unprecedented. So I think, I think the first thing you do in a situation like that, you try and, you try and understand just how much uncertainty there is and have some humility about your ability to, 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 to be able to, to forecast this winning kind of precision. Uh, and, and you don't know how, how hard it's going to go down, how long it's going to go down. And then when, 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 when you do attempt to reopen and, and, and have a resumption of activity, again, the, that resumption is going to be largely determined by the pace of the, the disease and people's reaction to the disease and their anxiety and fear as they, as they go forward. And that will determine how the growth. And I don't think you can have much confidence in your ability to forecast that in the short run. So I do think that when you think of the recoveries and there are people who say, well, we could have a V recovery, you could get the economic activity picking up. And then with all the stimulus, you could actually see some, uh, see some acceleration in a pretty meaningful way. It's not, not implausible. You could, you could have a challenge where you could never really get the uh, economic activity to pick up sufficiently to kind of get that kind of generation thing. And that's the real pessimistic case that we're really not going to get back to, to where we were for years. And then there's this uh, idea, which is kind of our base case, but, understanding it's a base case with lots of uncertainty that, that it could be a long, long U, it could be a kind of a long, longer recovery. And so when you look at that from an investment perspective, you try and say, okay, what, what, you know, what do you think, you know, what do you have confidence in what you don't you? And I think from our perspective, you know, our feeling is that we really need to be buying um, assets that we really feel can, can stand up if in fact the economic recovery is much slower than, than we would like. I mean, it, it, you can't know that that's not the case. And so from that perspective in the fixed income world, um, given some of the damage that was done in the higher quality sectors, uh, particularly investment grade, which got priced to a, uh, you know, at the bottom, a 20% cumulative five-year default expectation. You got to think about that. I think that that, you'll have different people argue, so many things got distressed, but if investment grade credit in the United States is priced to 20% defaults over a five-year period, that, you know, that, that, should be looked at as a comparison to after the financial crisis, five-year defaults peaked at two and a half percent, right? So the, 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 and the number one priority of the government is to protect the, the, you know, the basic machinery of the economy in order to restart. And that's why they've actually, uh, the, 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 the federal reserve has actually taken the historically unprecedented step of actually having a buy program for investment grade credit. So anyway, it, I don't, our thought was to get into the, those kinds of securities that were high quality, could withstand a long period of time, uh, and and then the extra benefit, uh, perhaps, of having the Federal Reserve uh, behind you would 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 uh, would also be a tailwind. Uh, related, to, you talked about uh, high quality corporate credit. Do you have do you have some thoughts on on the muni bond market? Yeah, the muni bond market, I think, has also got um, it got beat up pretty hard, as, and, and and that's why I, I clearly you're alluding to. Uh, and, and then the Federal Reserve had to step in uh, there. So the, the, I think that the the entire goal of uh, a policy in the United States is obviously to bridge this downturn in economic uh, activity in order to, to get back on their side. And so restoring the higher quality credit um, venues, investment grade uh, and minis, uh, you know, is kind of a first priority of the Fed. So they also took the unusual step of, of buying those securities there. So I think that there's uh, some opportunities in that in that space as well. And recently, you also uh, talked about how this is a very different recession, and uh, as I, I think in comparison to what we saw in 2008, 2009. And I wonder, uh, uh, you know, I know, for example, one uh, one argument people have made is that we, we now have kind of a, a large supply uh, shock uh, 
uh, that uh, not just a demand shock. And and right. and then there's other uh, other differences, uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, could, could be very important when we think about appropriate policy responses, and also could be important for thinking about how we emerge from this crisis. Can you elaborate on? You know the differences between what we're going through now and what we went through in two thousand eight uh, nine, and what what the implications of that might be. Yeah, I, I think this is a completely different situation. I, I think it's really extraordinary. I think that's one of the reasons why we're all kind of trying to figure out how to go forward. I think you know normally not just oh eight or nine, but 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 all the the economic downturns and recessions. You know, it's usually it, it's usually an endogenous event, right? It's usually a long business cycle. Some imbalances have ha ha have occurred maybe a policy mishap, uh, and then you get into a recession that, that becomes self-reinforcing, and obviously with the financial crisis and the housing and maybe some bad actors, you had, you had lots of challenges. But, but think about this. This is really a self-imposed downturn. I mean, this was a decision that was explicit. Let's, let's close the economy. This, this is an experiment that's never really been tried in the history of mankind. I mean, and, you know, and, 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 and given that, I think, you know, you just wonder, you know, you hope that, that, it, that it's well thought out. Obviously, you hope it's not, not, not too much hubris. You just don't know how it's going to turn out. The idea is you close the economy down, you protect, you protect as much as you can while you get through the, 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 the bending of the curve so that you don't have the, the, the hospitalization and, and, and medical infrastructure overrun, and then, and then you attempt to restart. So unlike any other uh, recession, here you have a deliberate attempt to slow down with a clear attempt to restart. So you haven't lost your physical plant capacity like you, you may in some recessions. It's a voluntary shutdown. And then I think the most important point is that monetary and fiscal policy are, are, totally, are totally proactive in trying to help the business community, the individual, and to get a recovery when it comes. And so policy is not extraordinarily stimulative and proactive. It's actually asymmetric. If, if policy is, is insufficient, there will be more. Right, so you, you know the direction of policy is coming uh, to try and be as supportive as possible. So I, I really think that that means that you have to think about how bad the downturn can be, which is of course like you do in any recession, but you do have to keep an eye out for the for the potential prospects of a recovery and and and, and what that might mean as well, because that's that is ex in fact the plan, right, to induce a, a recovery, you know, later this year. So. <clears throat> So how then would you assess, uh, you know, the fiscal and monetary policy uh, programs and, you know, forecasting, have we kind of run out of bullets? Is, <laughs> it's not, we keep saying that, by the way, we've been saying that for a long time that we've run out of ammunition, but they always seem to find more. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you assess the, the response and, and what do we have left? Well, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, yeah, on the monetary side, I think, you make a good point because Powell was quoted as saying, he was asked that question, can you run out of ammunition? He said, there's absolutely no possibility that the Fed can run out of ammunition. So he <laughs> he was very clear in his opinion. that, and, and, and I guess if you're willing to expand the balance sheet indefinitely and the political will is there to allow it, he, he's got a point. Um, look, I, I, I think, you know, we all recognize that, um, you know, the, the, the policy needed to try and protect a, a, an economy that, you're, you're going to throw 26 million people out of work in just the first five weeks. I mean, it's, it's just hard to even contemplate that. This is a two-front war. You're fighting the, the disease on the humanitarian front, but you're also, you're also trying to lean against a massive amount of economic pain and suffering that, 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 that's being caused at the same time. And so it's a very tough balancing act. And I think that the policy response is designed to put a floor under uh, the economic difficulty so that we we can get to the other side without too much damage. And so I think that that if you think about this as a relief uh, to the to the to the to the individuals and the and the businesses that are being caused by the pain of the voluntary shutdown, um, the response has been has been spectacular. I mean, we've never seen this kind of a uh, um, you know a, a, a relief package. The Fed obviously is a, a exploded their balance sheet. In conjunction with the Treasury and the uh, the CARES Act, where the Treasury takes the first loss piece, they've been able to expand their program to buying investment grade because of the definition of uh, the fallen angels. Anything before the package was announced, they can buy some some high yield bonds, uh, municipal bonds, uh, lending to Main Street. I mean, they've they've got their packages. So I think um, you know Jay Powell went on the Today Show 
which by itself is who's ever seen that before, the Federal Reserve Chairman going to the Today Show to talk about this policy. And he said, look, the number, he said, look, the Fed cannot, the Fed cannot, you know, stop the disease, right? It, it's part of the part of the solution, but it's not going to be the driver. But um, the number one point that he was trying to make was the number one way that the Fed was going to be involved in, in helping the US economy was going to be through its lending activities. And that would be their number one uh, uh, priority. Uh, but secondly, you know, uh, their interest rate policy was to get to zero very quickly, to do QA, to, to get more liquidity in, in the market. And he's been very vocal that he is not, that the Fed is going to continue to be stimulative until we get a vigorous recovery. Now, he was asked about that, and then yesterday he just said that means full employment. I mean, you think about that. When are we going to have full employment in the United States again mm -hmm. and a vigorous recovery at the same time? And until then, I think what he's saying pretty clearly is you can count on zero being the number that you're going to see for an awful long time. So I think the Fed is, 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 is all in. He said, he, and he said as much. And I do think that if, they, if there's not enough liquidity uh, because this gets worse before it gets better, you'll see, you'll see the Fed continue to come more. Obviously, on the fiscal side, we've never seen anything like this. 12% uh, of GDP with the CARES 1 and 2 acts together. Um, you know, I think we all recognize that when you're trying to do this much stimulus this quickly, while, while the enormity of it, I, I, it, it, it seems you, you, you've got to give, uh, I think, the government credit for really having tried to, to, to provide enough uh, relief to, 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 to let us get to the other side. Certainly, there are going to be, uh, you know, pockets of individuals who are not, you know, who, who were left out or, you know, don't get, don't get as much uh, help as they, they might as get. And there are going to be certain pockets of the business and, um, you know, financial sectors that are, that are not going to get no, no relief package this big and this quickly designed is going to be, is going to be perfect. But I think, I think by and large, um, I, I think as an attempt to fight a humanitarian crisis, the government's done an effective job. A question, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a Slido uh, question to follow up on this. Um, it asks, uh, how do you see the future of asset management in the world where the Fed and the government is determined to remove risk from risky assets for the foreseeable future? Well, if they've, if they've removed risk from the risky assets, then, then, then when I look at my, my screen, I shouldn't be see the stock market repricing three or 4% every day. So I don't think they've completely succeeded on the risky asset side. Um, I think, I, I, you know, I think that there, the question gets to the sense of moral hazard, right? So should the government actually be uh, removing moral hazard from a capitalistic society where there should be uh, risk and risk takers should bear the, the burden of when they're, when they're offside? I, I would differentiate, though, this. This, this is not this, – this, this was a government mandated shutdown, you know? So, I mean, this, this, you're not allowed to, 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 to run your business. You know, you, you have to stay at home. So uh, I do think that it, it is a little bit different. And I think that the idea is that you you want to, you want to uh, give people enough uh, to get to the other side. I, I think that um, if this, you know, if, if you were going to generalize to the next step after this, then if they kept doing it, you know, go down the, the checkerboard, many moves. But I think it's way too early for that. I do think this is the government trying to fight the fire that's in front of them and trying to get that under control before we go to the next steps. And I think that uh, giving, giving the private sector relief from, from, from the very governmental policy that was needed for the health crisis is, is not unreasonable. Yeah, I, I think you make a great point, um, you know, uh, distinguishing, uh, I think what some people think of a bailout today, but the, you know, the bailouts of 2008-9 where there was a clear moral hazard component and this is a purely right. exogenous shock. I think that's a very important point. I think it's reflected in a sort of public opinion uh, uh, around fiscal policy, for example. Um, and, and this is related to uh, a question that came up on Slido, uh, which is, you know, uh, your thoughts on Fed action to expand uh, the purchasing of corporate debt and, and the effective bailout of companies like Ford Motor Company. And um, it sounds like, you know, from your perspective, uh, the fact that we don't have this moral hazard component is really fundamentally, uh, makes this fundamentally different than what we may have done in 2008 and 9. Yeah, I think it is fundamentally different. I, I, do, I do think that if the nature of the question is, look, the government, because of these IG ratings are, and then fallen angels, is there going to be some winners and losers and it's not going to be perfect? I, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to push back on that, but I do think, 
you know, the ECB, the Bank of Japan have always had the, the ability to buy corporates. The Fed buying corporates is actually unprecedented in our history. And that, this is a new facility. But I think, look, I think their goal is simply to keep the machinery uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the great um, substance of the U.S. economic, uh, you know, business community intact so that when they start a restart, they'll have, they'll have the, the, the appropriate infrastructure. And I think that that, as a policy objective, is a reasonable one. Let me uh, go beyond the borders a little bit uh, in that, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the fragility and risk associated with global supply chains and uh, that there may be <clears throat> sort of a, um, a shift away from, say, China and uh, uh, to diversify global supply chains to mitigate risks that might emerge in any one single location. Where do you see globally... Uh, uh, p potential winners and losers uh, in in this kind of re restructuring and and then ha and and the implications of that for emerging market debt. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, you've got the you've got the the issue in front of you, but then you've always got to keep an eye on on, on how how this changes the landscape going forward. I I think that when you when you step back, I think there there are a couple things that that work. The emerging market debt narrative changed just spectacularly in a very short period of time. Because if you think about the possibility before the, the COVID-19 problem, again, it seems like a long time ago, you know, a, a pickup in global growth, diminishing in tensions between the US and China, Brexit going away, um, Fed already signaling that they wanted to get the inflation rate up in the United States. Um, this was a, a you know, pretty, pretty, pretty good backdrop for, for, for emerging market uh, uh, debt and for their economic growth. And you saw the World Bank and IMF all upgrading their, their forecasts at the beginning of the year. And now you've got the exact opposite, right? You've got the possibility of incredibly weak global growth. Emerging markets are very, very vulnerable to weak economic growth. They're very small economies. They don't control their own destiny. So that's a challenge. In addition to which, they don't really have the resources to deal with the COVID-19 crisis the way the developed world does. So they're really in a, in a, in a jam. I mean, they're in a really tough spot. Uh, and I do think that that means that that's uh, that's a sector that's already been beaten up, but it's 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 got um, it's it's got a high beta, if you will. If, if the global recovery really doesn't ever show up, I mean, they're they're, they're going to be in really deep deep difficulty. If, for example, you were in the V camp and we did get a surprise V recovery, then I think that they would be the surprise, but 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 clear beneficiaries of such a thing. So, but I do think that the the challenge is there. But your first part of the question, which is kind of longer looking than just this immediate. Um, downdraft and COVID-19 uh, point that I was making is, is a big one. What, what does the world look like on the other side? And I think um, I, I think an easy one is that U.S.-China relations, actually developed world and China relations, are going to be very, very tense for a long time. You've already seen not only, you know, we cover in our country, and obviously the president has his issues, and even today I think that, that he's going to announce some measures uh, about China, but you've seen the British – uh, uh, want to uh, launch an inquiry. You see the French start to think about launching an inquiry. The Australians are launched. I mean, the 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 uh, the anger uh, over the damage that COVID nineteen has done to so many countries, and 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 in many countries wanting to to put that that onus on China. I think that is gonna that is gonna last. And I th also think that in terms of medical infrastructure, your point, people are every country is going to consider that part of almost their national security. I think going forward. So. Bringing supply chains back, having uh, more uh, critical uh, uh, supply functions onshore, I think this all does bode poorly for the whole um, emerging market globalization, uh, you know, kind of theme we had, uh, you know, in the prior thirty years. Um, so, you know, uh, you, I, I'm sure, are spending a lot of time thinking about, uh, you know, when things or I, I won't say when things get back to normal that that's I think further away than we might expect but as we start to emerge from this crisis uh, you know as sort of a best case scenario uh, when do you see uh, the economy starting to turn around what sectors might lead that um, uh, and and what do you see as the biggest threats to short-circuiting uh, uh, some kind of re-emergence to a new normal yeah, in terms of the economy, um, look, I think the earliest we could we could we could you know 
could get positive growth would be the third quarter, but it's but it's not out of the question. The challenge, as we've already said, is is really the 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 the, the COVID nineteen and the consumer. Is the consumer going to be able to get over their anxiety and fear and and go back into the into the you know the the the, the shopping and communities and 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 be able to, to to function in a more normal way in a in a reasonably short period of time? And that that's going to depend, obviously, on 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 some you know public you know, kind of reaction function, but it's also going to depend on, on the therapies, right? If you, if you know you go out and it turns out that we've done broad-based testing and you're confident that unless you're older or have a pre-existing condition, the worst that's going to happen to you is the flu. That's going to give you more confidence. If, if you do get sick and, and there are effective therapies that, you know, you know, you'll get better, that will give you confidence. And of course, the ultimate game changer, which, which seems, you know, many people say it's far away, but actually it's, it, you know, who knows of the entire world scientific and medical community fighting to get into the vaccine space. If you could get a vaccine, it would be a game changer. And that that's not impossible. So th I think there's a lot of elements again on the, on the disease side that you have to um, you have to recognize could go in a number of different ways, but that would be the earliest I think you could get. But if you did get uh, some push there and, 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 and did get, um, you know, some confidence being restored by the, by the public, then I think all of this, this, this fiscal and monetary st stimulus would turn into a tailwind. And so you can see why that's not an impossible case that you could get a, a, a better economic result uh, earlier. Uh, um, that's a possibility. The, the, the challenges, I think, are the, are the opposite. What if people, we start, as you said, it's going to take longer than we think. We're going to get out. We're still going to be social distancing. People aren't going to be comfortable flying. They're not going to be comfortable in big crowds. So you, you're going to get some improvement, but you're, you're not going to get a big pickup in growth. And if that's true all over the world, really paltry growth for a long period of time, then can that substandard growth with all the debt that we've accumulated over the last decade really make it impossible for all this, uh, this short-term government help to, to turn the corner? And that's, the kind of the, that's kind of the pessimistic case. And then the real pessimistic case, I think we're all aware, is what if there's a second wave? What if, what if the virus comes back in the fall and some – really violent way, and that would be, that would really be a, a very tough situation. Um, I'm going to uh, take uh, some questions from the audience in a moment, but before I do, I just want to ask you, it's a little bit uh, different question, but it's one I know um, many people I've spoken to uh, uh, are, are, are contemplating, and I've had conversations with uh, many people in particular in, in, uh, in the investment management world and so on. And, and it's really thinking about how you're, you've managed your workforce through this crisis uh, and how you see the future of work. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we had a brief discussion earlier. Uh, I think all of us have been surprised by how effective uh, this kind of technology has been uh, for, certain, for some things. But it, for other things, it's, uh, in, in my view, uh, it's not very effective. Uh, in academic institutions, uh, one of the things that's very important for creativity and innovation is serendipitous meetings and ability to sort of uh, quickly uh, um, sort of exchange ideas. And I wonder, you know, in your business, um, you know, how you see technology potentially uh, changing the, the nature of the workplace for you and, and where you see kind of an in-person world being fundamental to being successful. Yeah, I mean, I, it, when you start thinking about how we're going to, you know, if we do reopen, how we're going to do that, it's, 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 um, you know, we have meetings on that and, 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 and different philosophies. I, I've always believed that, you know, we're organized with a trading floor. So the idea of a trading floor is that you put people in very close proximity to each other and they work closely. Communication flow is, is, is very important. Um, and, and then you've got the, the, the clusters of people. When you have a problem, you get the people who know the most about it quickly together. So you have idea, you have idea generation. You have a lot of good ideas come from these little clusters of people talking about issues and different possible ways they can they can solve problems. So I've always felt that 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 was a real positive, very very close proximity. Having said that, if you'd have asked, let's try an experiment and send everyone home, <laughs> I would never have tried it. I never would have tried that. Uh, and, and yet, 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 it's worked more more successfully than I would have ever imagined. So. Um, I do think that uh, I, I do think that it, it, it's, it's going to be a challenge, especially if we're going to have to go through social distancing for a long period of time. It's not going to be possible uh, to, to have a, a, a trading floor. You know, people huddle all over each other. If you have to have six feet of separation, that that's one thing. But I do think 
my sense is in the future you are going to have a lot more flexibility with respect to to working from home and, and using the technology that we've all seen develop and, and it's and it's improving all the time um, but I, I wish I had a, a stronger answer than that but th those are my initial impressions great well thank you so what I'd like to do now is take some questions uh, um, from the audience from the participants and uh, uh, some of these uh, didn't come up in our discussion but they're very interesting questions one has to do uh, one sort of theme in a few of our questions here is around um, uh, the status of the U.S. dollar uh, and how this uh, really unprecedented fiscal and monetary response uh, jeopardizes the U.S. dollar's uh, status as a reserve currency, uh, if it, in your view it does, uh, and, and what this might mean down the road. Uh, obviously, nobody sees inflation in any short period of time, but w whether this has uh, implications further down the road that we should be concerned about. Okay, it seems like there might be two parts to this question, but let's do the dollar first. You know, I think that the, it's a fair question and, and, you know, all the things being equal, you would say, well, if a country runs flamboyant fiscal deficits and, and fantastically you know, stimulative monetary policy, that that would be, um, you know, currency negative straightforwardly. So that, I, I, you know, I think that we all, we can all see that. But in this case, it's it's really it's a global it's a global response. It's not like we're the only country that is expanding our fiscal uh, uh, program and loosening monetary policy. You see the same thing out of Europe. You see the same thing out of UK. You see it out of Japan. This is a, is a global uh, fight to, to 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 fight the pandemic. The, I think Powell has been right to talk about this 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 issue. That you know the the immediate issue right is that there's this valley, this economic empty, you know, no economic activity, you have a huge, huge short shortfall in economic activity. You're hoping to, to restart the economy and, and make your way out. But the first and most important question is, can you get out, right? You need to get out. That's your first question. And that's the, that's the number one priority. Uh, and, and so that's a deflationary event. And, and that's, what they're, that's, what they're, that's what they're attacking. And you've seen it in the oil market where you've had negative oil prices, for God's sake, tells you how old I am. I never <laughs> thought we'd have negative interest rates. And I sure as heck never thought we'd have negative oil prices. You know, toxic waste. You pay me, I'll cart your oil away. You know, I mean, so I'm definitely too old. But the um, yeah, so I think that they're fighting the inflation event. I do, I do think that 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 the Fed would actually like to see the dollar weaker. You know, the dollar's been very, very strong. I mean, it's been, it's been. Uh, 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 I think that the dollar weakness providing more liquidity to the global marketplace, which is a which is it would be helpful to 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 the to the global economy. I think that that would not uh, bother the Fed too much if they could could achieve that. I think actually some of our um, I think some other countries around the world would actually have rather actually on the other side actually have their currencies be weaker. We've had this kind of, you know, kind of race to the bottom in terms of everyone wanting their currencies down to try and stimulate uh, some economic growth. And they think they'd like to have some inflation. So your second point about inflation, you know, second order effect, if we get to the other side, if in fact we get economic activity resuming, if the Fed stays too easy too long after that, can you start to see how you can have real problems? And again, a lot of ifs in that question. Um, but I think Powell answered that question pretty effectively too. He said, look, if you think about the great financial crisis, everyone asked the same question. Aren't we gonna have a ton of inflation with the zero interest rates, QE, uh, and they stayed there. And yet the, the, the challenge of the decade uh, that just passed was that the Fed was able never to get to their 2% target. They, they never achieved it. So I think that from his perspective, that is not a, a, a first order effect. And so I think that uh, he's been very clear that Look, when I, you know, if and when we see inflation ever get to our target, which they haven't been able to achieve, uh, you know, we'll we'll worry about that then. But until then, I think the the the, the bigger and most important challenge in front of them is 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 to get economic growth back on a solid footing. Uh, thank you. Um, another set of questions is around um, the IBOR transition, uh, the uh, inter interbank lending rate. Uh, uh, do you have some thoughts on that and whether or not uh, this, uh, uh, the current crisis uh, has an effect delaying that? You know, it, it may because obviously a lot of things are put on, um, you know, they're just not top priority in, in, a, in a crisis then, and there's some slippage in timetables and we've seen that with all sorts of government um, programs and policies already. Uh, I do think that the intent long term is to get away from LIBOR though. LIBOR, um, you know, it had, had, had terrific purposes. We had the 
the challenge that it was a, a privately marked instrument and we had scandals with respect to, to what the actual price was and price discovery. And I think uh, getting, getting away from that has been a, a priority and, and it will come to pass in our view. Uh, whether the timetable slips a little bit, I, I guess I, I, I would suspect that it would, but I don't think that the, uh, the path is, is going to be changed. Okay. How about uh, um, a shift? Uh, what are your thoughts about shift to uh, electronic trading uh, in, in fixed income, whether that, that uh, gets sped up uh, and, and where you, whether you see, especially in this sort of environment, <clears throat> that uh, this illiquidity environment we've seen, whether you think, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that, uh, that shift might happen uh, quicker. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, when people talk about, you know, try and project the future, I think that one of the things that you see in this environment, um, which is easier to predict than, than trying to, to be, a, um, you know, coming out of savant uh, on the other side, is trends that were in place that have been accentuated by the crisis, you can see how they're really going to pick up, right? So the electronic trading trend was already in place. It was, you know, you've seen the days of uh, trading places with everybody screaming on all the floors of the commodity exchanges are long gone, right? That's all been replaced by electronic trading. Uh, our firm, this percentage of electronic trading has been going up uh, every every year for the last 15. Um, platforms uh, uh, have emerged all over. So I do think that acceleration uh, has been accentuated by the crisis because obviously uh, you, you need to get to use electronic trading when you don't have the ability to do voice to voice. Um, so I do think that, that that's a powerful trend. I don't think there's any reversal. And I think the, the, uh, uh, I think the crisis just, just, just accelerates it. Uh, <clears throat> um, here's a question about the, a couple of questions about the Muni market. Um, uh, one is around uh, your view on seeing liquidity uh, improve in the Muni market, although it has improved uh, quite a bit recently. Uh, where you see that, and also, uh, you, are, are you concerned about defaults, uh, particularly in the state of California, uh, which uh, um, is very, I think, broadly sensitive to income tax and capital gain tax uh, uh, income? Yeah, on the, fir on the first uh, question, I think that the, the Fed has made it their absolute number one priority to, to restore liquidity and functionality uh, in, the, in the high quality sectors, and that's that's plumbing, and that's what the Fed does. They do it well. I mean, they 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 will they will soak the infield until liquidity improves. But the question, the bigger question, which is what the one you're asking, is not liquidity; it's solvency, right? What what about the credit worthiness of of of, of, of each of these municipalities? And that that's a much bigger big, bigger issue, and it's and it's one that's difficult. And I, I take your point on California. California's is is tax program is extraordinarily geared progressively. Uh, 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 to, to, to high income and especially to, to capital gains. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, aspect of the revenue. It's why they got in so much trouble in the, the great financial crisis. People right. might not remember you know, California yields, even in a 0% Fed funds environment, got to five and three quarters percent on their, on their GOs. People really thought that they wouldn't make it. In fact, if you recall, the federal government had to do a lot of, uh, uh, of help, uh, you know, build America bonds, et cetera, to, to help the states I, I really feel you're going to get state aid from the federal government here. That again, uh, they're they're being um, they're being beaten uh, in a number of ways. But but again, it, part of it is because of a, of, a, of a national emergency shutdown voluntarily. So I do think you're going to get some aid. The question is going to be much more complicated because this is a highly divided you know country on a on a on a on a, on a, on a, on a red versus blue and how you make those decisions and that's going to be very tough. I think the states that were already in trouble are, are the ones that we worry the most about. When you look at the states that were already uh, on, a, on, a, on a path that was difficult, like Illinois, are, are particularly challenged. And 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 and, and you know, New York and New Jersey, you've got a tremendous uh, expenses related to the uh, the COVID nineteen crisis. So we're, we're going to be thoughtful there. California has been the beneficiary, though, even though it has a very progressive income tax state uh, system and the, and the, the Trump tax. Bill, in my view, was really a red versus blue tax system, right? It really created it, 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 a massive incentive to, to move from a, a blue state to a red state. But California is held up because it has the number one industry in the world, right, which is tech. And it's, and it's also got some other benefits in terms of global trade and, and industry. So the, if you look at the, the economics of California, you haven't seen um, the weak, weakening of the, the California economy like you've seen some of the other uh, uh, blue states over the last four or five years before the crisis. So I think... California is going to suffer, uh, 
but it really will depend on what the recovery looks like on the other side. But I do think you need to be thoughtful about municipal credit going forward and, and really is going to be, um, you know, kind of issue selection state by state. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a sort of a, a question uh, I think we're all uh, interested in understanding. And then I have sort of a, a follow on question that I think will be particularly interesting and important to our, our current students. So uh, how do you think the pandemic will transform the asset management industry in the longer term? But then also, you know, as you uh, can uh, understand, our, a lot of our students who are, want to pursue careers uh, in, the, in this industry would also, I think, like to know uh, uh, what the prospects are, and, but also where you see uh, the, the skills and capabilities that the industry is going to uh, demand in, in, the, uh, in, say, the near and intermediate term. Okay, well, you've got a lot going on there. I, I you know, I, uh, Tony, I think, um, I think, I think it's difficult to be able to see with any kind of real clarity exactly how the pandemic is going to transform the asset management business. So clearly, in terms of, um, we've already talked about workplace functionality and things like that. Obviously, whenever you have a, a massive, um, you know, just kind of an earthquake kind of event, whether it's global financial crisis, the Nasdaq break. The Iraq War. Thing. You always go back and, and look at your, you know, look at your firm and look at the events and try and learn from them and think about you know how you might have had a better um, setup to prepare for those kinds of, uh, of shocks. That's why I talked about how you never can anticipate. You always you can never anticipate the next true surprise. So you really have to have kind of a culture and and and, and personalities that have that reactive, um, you, you know, kind of kind of uh, skill set because. You know, you're you're working on one project the next day, and then your entire world changes, and you need to be able to shift and 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 do so pretty quickly. I think that that's that's an aspect of the investment management business that that is necessary. It's also what makes our business fun, right? It's not it's not boring. It's not the same thing every day. Things are changing all the time, and you have to be, uh, you know, so it, it provides a lot of uh, a lot of fuel for your intellectual curiosity. And so I think that that that's why, of course, that it's my passion. So I'm I'm obviously, uh, you know, would be. Uh, very encouraging. I, mean, I do think the skill set for the investment business, maybe it's because I'm older and I'm not a tech guy. So, I, you know, you all the tech things you need. I, I, I'm probably the last person to ask about specific technological capability. But I do think that the, you know, the, when you look at investments, you know, you think about it, your, your, your advantage is either informational or it's judgmental. And, and informational in this day and age is really hard to come by. And uh, so you're really looking at, you know, the way, you, way your, your judgment and perspective and the way you think about, you uh, you know, uh, investment um, uh, investment analysis, and, and whether or not you think you have a perspective that 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 gives you uh, some kind of an edge or, or a different take on, on 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 an investment that someone else has. I don't I don't think that those kind of traits that have been the traits of successful investors over the centuries are are, are likely to change much. So I I, I guess I would be um, I wouldn't be too put off by this one event. Well, um, I. Uh... I'm going to uh, um, just, I think we've captured most of the questions from the audience and I'm, uh, I'm going to at this point express my sincere gratitude for your being here today. I, I found this extraordinarily informative and enlightening and uh, your insights were really uh, 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 very illuminating and I'm sure all of our participants are, are, are deeply grateful for you taking the time to be with us today. I was going, you know, you have had uh, so many wonderful thoughts uh, today, and I was just going to give you uh, the last word, so to speak, if you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share. But again, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, this has really been a wonderful uh, discussion, and I, uh, I'm speaking for everybody. I know we've learned uh, very much today. Well, I want to I want to say thank you to you all for having me and, and having me at the uh, on the conference, and uh, um, so I I I I, I want to just uh, you know. Give you an ad boy back. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate your going easy on me today. It was very nice of you. <laughs> I, something tells me, I, I don't know if there's any way anybody could be hard on you. I think you have all the answers. So uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, Lori, um, I'm not sure uh, if you want to sort of say some concluding words, but again, uh, thank you. My sincere uh, appreciation, Ken. Thanks.
Well, I, I don't think that there's much to add beyond saying thank you to, to Ken, uh, thank you to you, Tony, and thank you to everybody in the audience for sharing your morning with us. We look forward to convening again uh, soon on, on other topics and look out for some emails from us. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.